Listen as the Word of God is taught to you, young people. Now let's take our Bibles upstairs to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Open your Bibles with me this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Come out and be separate, the Bible says. This is Paul's burden from God to the church at Corinth. Listen, something was hindering God's work in their midst. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look with me at verse 11. 2 Corinthians 6, 11. O ye Corinthians, that group of believers there in Corinth, the church, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. We love you. We're reaching out to you. We're, we're desiring to, to, to do all we can in your midst. Ye, verse 12, 2 Corinthians 6, are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own vows. Something was going on at the church at Corinth. Of course, Paul dealt with this in the first letter, and now he's dealing with some other things going on in this letter. God wanted his people to be his people. God wanted his people to be in fellowship with him and to be the, his sons and daughters living in joyful relationship with him. That's what God wants for his people. That's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for me. He wants his church to be his church, to love him and to walk with him and to not be what the world is, but to be separate and, and a powerful people bringing glory to God, right? So Paul, under this burden of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, writes to them and says, verse 1 of chapter 6, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1, we then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Let God do his work. Let God change you. Don't hinder God's work in your life. That's the challenge. And it's a very clear challenge to us, isn't it? Paul's motive for ministry is clear. He's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit so that the light can shine in the darkness we heard the message. We understood the truth. God opened our eyes. People need to be saved from their sin. And Jesus is the answer. That's, what we, that's who we need. And we've accepted him. So Paul is depending on God. Paul is serving in the spirit. We need a spiritual ministry today as God does his work in our hearts. The power of God in our lives. And the goal. All right. Paul's motive. His desire. The goal is to see God change our lives. God wants to change us. 2 Corinthians 5. We're in chapter 6. Look at came right before this. Look at verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So God, through Paul and the Holy Spirit to, this morning, through the word of God, is calling us to come out and be separate. To be that people of God, that that living in fellowship and loving God and walking with Him. And Paul shares this burden with the people of Corinth and God shares it with us this morning. A spiritual ministry, the goal of a spiritual ministry is the, to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. This is where we end this morning. Chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us, Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, but all things become new. So don't receive the grace of God in vain, verse 1 of chapter 6. Instead, let's perfect holiness in the fear of God. Let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, and let's perfect holiness in the fear of God. That's where we're going in our study this morning. Paul gives his own testimony in the middle of this passage. Paul did not want the ministry of God to be hindered in his life. He wouldn't let anything hinder God's work through him. All of God's, all of God's um, blessings and, and, and ministry was happening through the Apostle Paul. He gives this little thought in the middle of how he was faithful to serve God so that the church at Corinth would know the work of God in their lives. And so we want to be encouraged that, to, to be strong in the Lord and to, let, to stand in God's grace. And, and God will be faithful. God's grace is sufficient in our lives. And then God would use us to do his work in others' lives. 
Paul wanted the believers, God wants us to know the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God wants us to know that good work that he began in us perform. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. God wants us to know that. Here's the question now as we begin. Is evil, evil and sinful influences will hinder God's work. Is God's work hindered in your life? That's the question. You need to hear the call this morning to come out and be separate from the influence of sin and evil that's all around us. Jesus prayed in John 17, folks, that his people would be kept from the evil in this world. Jesus did not pray that we'd be taken out of the world. He prayed that we would be kept from the evil in the world. That's a serious concern. <laughs> So let's walk in holiness before the Lord. Let's not hinder God's grace. Let's come out and be separate. Keep it in mind this morning. It, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. I can stand up here and list some examples, but the Holy Spirit's going to say to your heart and your walk with Him, if you're humbled and listening, He'll say, this is an area that's hindering your walk with me. And you might think there's nothing wrong with it until God convicts you of it. And so other people might say there's nothing wrong, but it's hindering God's work in your life. It's a sin that's, that's hindering what God wants to do. So keep this in mind. Come out and be separate. It doesn't have to do with this big idea of, oh, well, that's something the church says. It's a personal walk with God, and maybe it's whatever God puts his hand on, let's come out and be separate for the glory of God, right? Number one, notice the life-changing grace in verses 1 and 2. God's grace is where everything starts. It comes from God, not man. Are we reconciled to God and walking with him? Look at verse 1. We then as workers together with him, with who? With God, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, God says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee, or helped thee, supported thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. All right, so verses 1 and 2, Paul lays this groundwork of a life-changing grace. Number one, he talks about being workers together. Paul was, in simply, Paul was simply an ambassador of Jesus. Look at verse 20, 20, 20 of chapter 5. Right there beside it, look at verse 20 of chapter 5. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So he gets into verse 1, chapter 6, he says, we then as workers together with, and it's God he's talking about, because we're the ambassadors of Christ. God was at work through Paul, that was what mattered, and that's still what matters today, folks. The church is God-centered, not man-centered. We need to know God's work in our midst. So the work of God is calling me and you, not Paul, not Pastor Dan, but God. We then as ministers together, we then as workers together with him, God is beseeching us, come out and be separate. You with me? You see where this, where, where this starts? Paul makes this clear in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. The vineyard or garden is God's. The people of God are his planting. The building is God's. The people belong to God. We work together as ministers of God to help each other grow in the Lord. Right? It's not about man. It's about God. And what is it about God that, that God wants us to know that Paul is, is concerned about? We then as workers together with him beseech you that you what? Verse 1. Receive not the grace of God in vain. Paul wanted the believers at Corinth to respond to the grace of God in their lives. Number one, to hear the gospel, the good news, that Jesus died for you and me as sinners, and to believe the truth about Jesus. Number one, receiving the grace of God is verse two, the accepted day of salvation. And that's now. Maybe there were some among them, Paul knew this, who had not yet received the grace of God in Jesus for salvation. They would not, therefore, know the grace of God in living a holy life because they weren't saved to begin with. The word of God is clear. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the accepted time of grace, of God's grace. And this is where it starts in receiving God's grace. But, but Paul also challenges the believers who had already accepted the grace of God in the acceptable time 
He challenges these believers to not receive the life-changing grace of God in vain. Look at it says in verse 1, receive not the grace of God in vain. That means let God do his work. Don't waste the grace of God that's changing you and growing you. Paul does not want God's grace to be hindered in their lives. That's where we're going. He wants them to go on to holiness and perfection. Chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receiving the grace of God, not in vain, but as an actual growing reality. Is God's work hindered in your life? God... Is God's work hindered in your life? God wants us to walk by faith each day. And God wants us to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So th there's life-changing grace. Paul says, we're workers together with God. We want you to know the grace of God and how it's going to change your life. Number two, Paul gives his, his burden as a servant of God. And he gives his, his what's the word of where He gives this, this picture of how God's work was being done through him. God is at work. His grace is known. So Paul's desire is to be a faithful minister. Look at verse 3. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry. What's the ministry? The grace of God. Workers together with God. That the ministry be not blamed. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Verse 1. Workers together with God. We don't want anything to hinder God's work through us. We want to be approved as the ministers of God. This is such an interesting passage. It actually deserves more time to give us Paul's personal motive in ministry, Paul's personal um, commitment to keep serving God even through the struggles. That, there's a wonderful picture here of Paul's heart uh, to, that kept him pressing on when it was difficult. But let's keep it in the context there's a work. Think about this. This is, this is what the point is. There's a work that God was doing, and Paul was a part of that work, and he wasn't going to let anything hinder that work so that the church at Corinth, the people at, at, at Corinth, God's people, would know all of God's grace and be able to grow in their walk with God. That's the main thought. Verse 11. Look at verse 11. Paul's heart and mouth was open. He, he had a a desire to help them in their walk with God, to be a co-laborer with Christ. He wanted to be a blessing as the grace of God would be at work in them. So look at this unhindered ministry. Number one, he would give no offense. Verse three, giving no offense in anything. Paul did not want to hinder God's work, that the ministry be not blamed. Paul did not want his life or attitude to be a stumbling block to other believers. He did not want to give anyone occasion to blame or speak ill of God's grace. Paul was serving God. That's the word ministry. So he wanted his ministry, his service, to be blameless. He wanted to be a vessel that God's grace could flow through. It's a great question. Now, again, we're not going to get into the, to all of the depths of this for Paul, but it's a great question here. Is that how we live our lives? I want to be holy and set apart to you, God, for your glory. And then I realize that as I walk with you and your grace is at work in my life, I can have an influence on others. I can be used by you to influence others in their walk with you. Are we a faithful servant of God so that the grace of God's not hindered? Let's live in such a way that the grace of God is magnified in our lives. Not hindered, giving no offense. Number two, he wants to be approved. So here's the positive. The negative is giving no offense. The positive is verse four, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. He wanted to have a good testimony. Paul wanted to be a vessel where God's grace was actively at work. So the church at Corinth could receive through Paul the grace of God. So Paul would therefore be a faithful minister. He would not let anything hinder and he would be approved. The approved life is one that is unhindered by sin in the world. Paul's message, come out and be separate, was already at work in Paul's life. So that he could be a faithful minister instrument, a, a tool that God could use, a faithful servant of the Lord. The proof life is one that is unhindered by sin in the world. Paul knows this. So he says to him, I, I want to be a faithful minister. I want to be used by God for your good, for God's glory. 
God's hand is upon this one that walks by faith and lives by God's grace. And God's grace is able to flow freely. Paul is sharing this burden. And again, it gives us a wonderful glimpse into how Paul pressed on and kept serving God. He had a burden for the grace of God to be at work through him in others' lives. So just, just briefly, look at his what he, what he went through. Look at what he endured as a faithful minister of God so that the grace of God could flow through him to others. There are trials in our walk with God. Satan will try to hinder our ministry and our desire to serve God. He'll try to hinder that in our lives. Satan will try to hinder God's grace. But walking by faith will allow God to use us no matter what our circumstances are. Dependence on God and relying on him allows his grace to flow freely. And that's Paul. Look at verse 4. He lists 10 things, 10 difficulties in verse 4 and 5. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. Paul wanted to be blameless. He wouldn't give offense. He would press on by faith. And any one of these could have hindered God's grace. God's work through Paul. But he was standing on the grace of God. He was pressing on so that God could use him and do the work. And then he tells us in verses 6 through 8 how this faith worked. Look at verse 6. By pureness. Purity, righteousness. By knowledge. Verse 6. That means knowing the truth. He suffered long, verse 6. By the uh, long suffering. He, he didn't quit when it got hard. By kindness, he says. And then he says how he had the ministry of the Holy Ghost. By the Holy Ghost, God was empowering him and encouraging him and strengthening him. He says number, in verse 6, love by love unfeigned. A genuine love for God and for others. In verse uh, 7, by the word of truth, standing on what the word of God said. And then verse 7, by the power of God. He had relied on the power of God as he had on, verse 7, the armor of God. On the right hand, the armor of righteousness. On the right hand and on the left. Again, Paul was going through these difficulties. And even verse 8, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. Whatever people said about him, he was continuing. His conscience was clear. He was continuing to serve God and rely on God and depend on God. Think about it. And he was being used by God. It, his mouth, verse 11, was open. His heart was enlarged. The church at Corinth was not missing anything because of Paul. They were missing something because of, of sin in their own lives. So Paul's giving his testimony of a grace-filled ministry. What you and I want to have. God, am I able to be used by you? Am I, am I filled with your grace and, and relying on you by pureness, by knowledge, long-suffering, kindness, the Holy Ghost, love unfeigned, the word of truth, the power of God, the armor of righteousness, Honor and dishonor, whatever they're saying, evil report and good report, I'm going to be faithful to you. What a great, what a great heart. And then lastly, number three, the outcome is confidence in ministry. Confidence and ministry by God's grace. Verse 9. At the end of verse 8, as deceivers and yet true, he was true. Verse 9, as unknown, yet well known by God. As dying, behold, we live. Nobody could kill him. He was going to live until God said it was time. How many times did he get stoned? As chastened and not, not killed, he was put down, but yet he was not utterly destroyed. Verse 10, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Amen. As poor yet making many rich because of the truth of God. As having nothing and yet possessing all things. Oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Paul gives this beautiful picture, and the outcome is this wonderful approving by God. All of this is how Paul would give no offense and be approved in the ministry. God's grace would flow through Paul because he had an unhindered ministry, the grace-filled ministry. Let's walk by faith so that God's grace can be seen in our lives, vessels that can be filled with God's grace for ministry, and then God will use us in the lives of others. So here's the main thought this morning. Perfecting holiness. All of this is leading to this thought. Paul says in verses 1 and 2, God's grace is at work. God's grace is, is in your midst. God is doing his work. He says in verses 4 through 10, it, I've gone through different things and my burden is to, to be right with God so that God can keep doing his work through me. 
So he gets to this part in verse 11 of chapter 6, and he says, so what are, are you going to allow God to do his work in your life? Besides Paul's testimony, the challenge now comes to the individual. There's nothing we can do about Paul. I mean, I want to be like Paul, and you want to be like Paul. I think to study those verses would be a great encouragement as we seek to serve the Lord and be faithful to God. What a great picture of, of his desire and ministry, his heart. But we come to verse 11 and 12 and following, and the challenge becomes personal. Paul could do this. Paul could say, I'm a faithful minister of Christ. But unless my life is free from the influence of sin and evil, unless I've said, I'm not going to let anything hinder God's grace in my life, I'm going to miss it. God can be at work in all kinds of ways, in a fellowship of God's people, in the preaching of his word, in different ways. Circumstances that God's at work, and we can still miss it. Because it comes to a personal decision, a personal commitment. Verse 13, verse 12, ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. So verse 13, now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Let, let the work of God flow freely. <coughs> Open it up. Stop being straightened. Isn't that an interesting word in verse 12? The word straightened means squeezed. It means tightened. That's the word straightened here. It means restricted. Paul wanted the believers to know the grace of God in their lives. Verse 11, our mouth is open, our heart is open. But something was hindering God's work, verse 12. You were being, you're being straightened, you're being restricted, you're being squeezed. God's work was being done through God's faithful ministers, Paul and the others. God's grace was flowing, but they were being hindered. Something was making the way difficult, straightened, pressed. So Paul calls upon them, verse 13. To open their hearts. Open your heart to God's grace. He calls upon them to make the way clear for God's grace to flow and to change them. And he's going to get to that then starting in verse 14. How, how can they do that? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You're a child of God. Why is sin allowed to influence your life and hinder God's work? Just as Paul needed to walk by faith so that the trials and difficulties wouldn't hinder God's work in his life. So the believers in Corinth needed to walk in separation and holiness so that God's work would not be hindered in their life. They would know all that God was doing through Paul and others. Paul knew God's grace so these believers could know God's grace as well if they would come out and be separate. Something was going on. Verses 11 and 12 tell us that something was happening in the, the, the believer's life at Corinth, individually and corporately, that was hindering God's work. So what are we going to do about it? Number one, no compromise. We have to make a decision, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's, where, that's the heading. That's where it starts. Believers and unbelievers, righteousness and unrighteousness, sin and holiness, those things do not go together. So what he asks some questions. He says the command is don't be unequally yoked. Now, the Bible speaking here in an agricultural setting of two cows would be put together in one yoke. You know that piece of wood that went over two cows and it would then draw the plow through the field. So two cows were yoked together to do the work. Well, the idea here is you put a cow with a donkey or, or you put a, a donkey with a chicken. You, know, you, you can get all kinds of mixes here, and you're not going to get anywhere. Unequally yoked are two, in an agricultural setting, two animals that weren't meant to pull together. They won't pull together. But that's just a picture for the Christian then to say, what am I allowing to be a part of my life? Is it hindering God's work, or is it complementing? So he starts to ask some questions in verse 14. For what fellowship 
hath righteousness with unrighteousness. You see the word fellowship, that's that coming together and, and being able to rejoice together. Righteousness and unrighteousness, what, those two don't go together, right? I, I want what's right. I want God's way. And an unrighteousness is man's way, sin's way. You're going two different directions, right? You can't plow in the same direction. What communion hath light with darkness? Communion, common. What what commonality has light and darkness? It doesn't. Light sheds away darkness. They don't exist together. They can't. What concord? Verse 15. What concord? That agreement. That's, you know, make a concord agreement. What agreement hath Christ with Belial? Jesus with Satan. Well, there's no agreement. Jesus conquered Satan. He, he destroyed the enemy. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? An unbeliever. That's the word. Believer, or unbeliever. What part, what, is there anything that, that we can say we agree on? Anything that's important. I'm not talking about agreeing on what's your favorite sports team. What a joke. This is about what matters in my life. I want to agree on who God is, what God is doing, what the truth is, and how I should walk with him. Unbelievers don't care. They do what they feel like doing. So what part, what agreement do you have with an unbeliever? You can associate, you can... See unbelievers, you can talk to unbelievers, but you don't have a part with unbelievers. You get it? You see it? There's no communion with light and darkness. You, you see darkness, but you can't commune with it. If you do, you're not light. You don't have fellowship with unrighteousness if you love righteousness. You can see unrighteousness, but you don't have that togetherness with it, or you're in trouble. So verse 16, he brings it to an end. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols, what what agreement? What what uh, what? Yes, together can they say? Idols are totally against God. Idols are in the place of right in the place of God, and yet we are the temple of God. Paul sums it up in verse sixteen: For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That brings the sense to these questions, doesn't it? No compromise should be the reality of our lives because we are the people of God, verse 16. God is dwelling in us. He, we are his temple. The living God is in my life. So what part, what communion, what fellowship, what agreement, what concord can I have with that which is against God. We're the temple of God. God dwells in the child of God. God dwells in the church, the people of God. So sin and evil and wickedness do not belong. It does not belong in the, in the corporate body. It will hinder God's work. And it doesn't belong in the individual life. It will hinder God's work. Our sanctification, the receiving of God's grace. Verse 1. Verse 1, the receiving of God's grace will be hindered. Our sanctification, our walk with God will be hindered if we allow the sin and evil of the world to be in our lives. We must have no fellowship with that. No compromise. You see the point? No compromise. We're not straightened. Paul said you're not straightened in us. You're straightened in your own selves. So, what does he say in verse 14? Be not unequally yoked together. Because they were. Something was allowed in their midst to hinder God's work. Be not unequally yoked. No compromise. Number two, come out. Be separate. He says, be ye not unequally yoked. Verse 14. Now look at what he says in verse 17. Wherefore, for this cause, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. That's a quote. It's a, it's a reference back to the book of Leviticus. The Old Testament book that called the children of Israel to a separate living because they were the people of God. God called his people to come out, come out of Egypt, right? Amen. To come out from the midst of the nations around them, come out and be separate. Verse 17, and touch not the unclean thing. The idea of touching the unclean thing 
the Israelites would be defiled by touching a dead body. They would be defiled by touching something that was unclean, anything that was dirty, and they would not be able to, to offer their sacrifice until they were cleansed. So they would not touch a dead animal so that they wouldn't be defiled. That's what God is calling us to do. We must not allow any of the evil and wickedness of this world to defile us. Come out and be separate. Now this is why I quoted what Jesus prayed in John 17. Jesus prayed to God, I don't pray that you'll take them out of the world, but that you'll keep them from the evil. See, we can't get away from it. In that sense, we live in this world, but we must not touch the unclean thing. No, we have to live around it. It has to be, you know, we're in its midst, but yet we can be kept from it. You see the challenge? Jesus didn't save us and then take us right to heaven. We're here in the midst of sin and evil, but we're not touching the sin and evil. We're not letting it influence our lives. It's a, it's a, it's a very clear call to be set apart in a wicked world. And what does it say in verse 17? And I will receive you. See, that's where this is all going. That's where, that's where we bring this to, to, its, to its glorious <coughs> amen. <laughs> I want to be set apart. I want no compromise, no fellowship with that which is wrong. And I want to be separate and come apart from the unclean things. I don't want it to defile me so that I can have this wonderful relationship with you. I, I, God's glory will shine through us as a holy people but then personally, verse 17, I will receive you, verse 18, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So number one, we, the call is to come away from the sinful influences that would hinder our walk with God. And number two, to be received by God, to walk in fellowship with God, to have that, that calling as his sons and daughters on our lives, daily walking in communion with him. And so number three is, is that call. Verse 1 of chapter 7. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse. See, the problem was something was defiling them. So cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. That's the body and the mind and the heart. Don't just get rid of the outward stuff and let your heart follow after all of its evil. You, I want to be right with God, set apart from those things. And I want to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Chapter 7, verse 1, brings to mind James chapter 4. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And what does it say in James 4? Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Because we've cleansed our hands, we've purified our hearts. Verse 1 of chapter 7, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, and perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect, in this life, it means I'm maturing. I want to perfect that work of holiness. He who began a good work in you, I want it to be perfected. I want it to be completed. But sin will hinder. Can you see it? Can you see how the, the passage, Paul's burden, very clear burden, is God's grace is at work, and I don't want to hinder that grace. I want to be a faithful minister, so all that I'm going through is for God to use me but something's hindering God's work in your life. You're straightened. So, verse 17, come out. Have no un unequal yoking. Come out, verse 17, and, and I will receive you. And so, cleanse yourself of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Come out and be set. God wants us to be set apart to him. God wants us to be holy as he's holy. Perfecting holiness. And when we are set apart from sin and evil, number one, we'll know God's fellowship as his sons and daughters. And number two, God will be glorified through his people. What is the song we sang? We're going to close with it here in just a minute. In my life, be glorified. In your church, be glorified. Come out, come apart. Paul was a faithful minister of God's grace. God's grace was flowing. Would these believers receive God's grace and grow in their sanctification? Will we? Will we perfect holiness in the fear of God? Let's pray together. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Brandon's going to come and play that song at the piano 310. And we'll sing just the first and third verse to bring it 
to our hearts and give us a chance to, to, to have that prayer outwardly. But right now, as she plays through it just once or twice, from your heart, God, I want the grace of God to be received. I want to know that grace. Help me see what's hindering your work. And then God, give me grace to come out and be separate. Say that to God from your heart here this morning. This could be a turning point. This could be an opportunity for God's grace to flow freely and for you to grow in your walk with Him. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the, the accepted time. So, God, have, have we made that decision? Have we come in faith and trust to use our Savior? Have we, have we been saved? Well, today, God, is the day to say, I'm going to come out and be separate. I'm not going to let sin anymore straighten me, hinder me. I'm going to be free in the grace of God. Not free to do what I want, but free to let God perfect holiness in my life. God, change us, I pray for each one of us, wherever it needs to happen. May there be this change for your glory in our life. And then God, for the, for the work of the kingdom, a holy people that are set apart to you. Receive us as sons and daughters. What a wonderful fellowship and relationship as we walk in holiness. God, help us know that on a regular basis too. So help us cleanse our spirit and our flesh from all filthiness. And grow in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 310, just the first and third. I like those two verses in my life and in your church.